Good morning and welcome to um, our online service, uh, our online talk uh, for St John's uh, today. Um, and we're continuing our series looking at uh, Luke's Gospel uh, and thinking about dis discipleship. Um, Lynn led us looking at, uh, at the end of, uh, of, of Luke chapter 9 last week and this week we're looking at uh, Luke chapter 10 verses 1 to 12. Lynn reminded us last week uh, and challenged us to make sure that Jesus was our priority. And in many ways, we continue that today as we, we begin looking at proclaiming the kingdom, the idea of mission, of sharing the good news of Jesus. Is that part of the priority of uh, of, make, of of Jesus, of following Jesus, of being his disciple? With that, that thought in mind, let's, uh, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is as ever a light to our feet um, and, and a lantern to our way. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, really speak through uh, through myself now as we as we look at this passage, but that you change and speak to each of our hearts as we listen. In your name, we pray. Amen. So, Luke chapter ten, uh, verses one to twelve, uh, proclaiming the kingdom. C.S. So yes, Lewis is best known uh, for writing the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, but his best-selling book is actually one called Mere Christianity. And he says in that, uh, and it's a great quote, the church exists for nothing else but to draw men to Jesus. If they aren't doing this, then all the cathedrals, all the clergy, all the missions, even the Bible itself, are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. It's a great quote, isn't it? And uh, it, it, it's really relevant, I think, to our passage today. today. A, clear, a clear statement, if you like, of our mission to proclaim the gospel. You may feel that this mission that Jesus has left us is just too hard, maybe. There are so many people to reach, it feels impossible. And then there, there are all the barriers to sharing the gospel, the language and culture, social class. Uh, and what about the opposition, which feels like it's growing, making making our task even harder? Our families, our families, our friends, the media, politicians, all seem to, to oppose the gospel. Today's passage, though, is exactly what we need to hear. Not, not because Jesus is saying it's easy. In fact, he's not. Um, he, he's saying, you know, he's being very honest with us and saying, no, it won't be easy. But because he tells us to persevere, persevere in proclaiming the gospel, no matter how difficult it seems, Jesus is saying to us to make it our priority. It's the one thing we need to do. In, in chapter 9 and verse 51, we see that Jesus sets sets his face towards Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, Jesus will, of course, be crucified. He'll be raised from the dead and then he'll be crowned and enthroned as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. But before getting to Jerusalem, he sends out these, these 72 ahead of him to proclaim, if you like, proclaim his enthronement, proclaim what he is about, what he's working towards. In verse 1 we read, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. They are, if you like, a unique group appointed by Jesus as at a unique time in history with a unique command. Yet we shouldn't dismiss it because here, here are general principles for mission that apply to all of God's people for all of time. So that includes us today, now, here, here in the 21st century. Luke is telling us that the right response to Jesus going to Jerusalem is for, is for his followers to go and proclaim the gospel, to evangelise for his kingdom. So it is for us. So what does it look like to be on mission for Jesus? I want to make four points this morning. Um, that mission is dependent on Jesus. That mission is deeply divisive. That mission is deeply urgent and that above all mission is verbal and, and we'll pick out the, 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 the back up to, to those to those points as we look at the passage together so the first one our mission is dependent on jesus and uh, we see that in verse two he told them verse two the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few ask the lord of the harvest therefore to send out workers into his harvest field jesus is the Lord of, of the harvest, an obvious but important thing 
important uh, thing. Jesus is saying there are many who are ready and ripe for the harvest, who are ready to believe. We often think, or maybe we do uh, occasionally think, that people don't want to hear hear about Jesus, that they've no, that they've no time for Jesus, that they can't be bothered with, with Jesus. But what Jesus is saying here in this verse, in verse 2, it is that the problem is not a lack of demand, but a lack of supply. Jesus says there are lots of people wanting to become Christians. Probably there isn't enough Christians, though. The problem is that there isn't enough Christians, though, to tell them uh, the gospel. Some statistics from the USA show those who claim to go to church, only 50% go to church on Sunday. 70% never attend a church prayer meeting and we're still 95% have never shared the gospel with anyone. What a tragedy. What a tragedy because demand for the gospel, Jesus is saying, is like stripping supply, the supply of gospel workers, people able and willing to share the good news of Jesus. Maybe you have shared the, uh, the good news of Jesus with people. Maybe that's 10 or 20 or, or, or 30 or more in your life. And, and, it, and it seems to you that they just weren't interested. But Jesus is saying here, look, the harvest is plentiful. Or perhaps you help deliver um, the good newspapers around Hensigan, which is what some people do here. And, um, and yet, despite many visits, no one has yet become a Christian. Does that, does that mean that Jesus is wrong? And then uh, that uh, the harvest isn't plentiful. Well, I think it was saying no a million times. No, that's not right. The issue is that the problem is one of the issue is the problem. Issue here is the sample size that you're looking at. But we're simply looking at a very small, very very small sample. I have to say there are over five thousand adults in St John's Hensigan Parish. In reality, then. As we as we deliver those newspapers into into the parish, we're really only scratching the surface. We're not going to every home. The harvest is plentiful, Jesus is saying, but there is a shortage of bold, persevering Christians to tell the gospel, to tell the good news of, of, of the harvest. The harvest is plentiful, but there's a shortage of workers to to share that good news. So Jesus is saying we must pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. Pray for new people, for new labourers. We pray for new people to come and join our church to help with gospel outreach. We must pray too for, for those who labour currently, people like you and I. Maybe we feel a little jaded. Maybe we feel like giving up. So pray that, that we will persevere in being on mission for Jesus. Pray too for more full-time workers for new labourers to go into the uh, into the full time into full time Christian ministry, making it their life's work, their life's job to proclaim the gospel in West Cumbria, in the UK, and, and beyond. The great assurance is that Jesus is in charge; He is the Lord of the harvest, as that verse says. The lo the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And here it is. That's why we need to pray. Ask, pray to the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So let's pray for ourselves and pray for, for more to come and to share the good news of Jesus. Augustine, a great early Christian martyr, says this. Pray, he says, as though everything depends on God, but work as though everything depends on you we have a calling we have a task we have a work to do the workers are in short supply so the more we do the more the gospel will be proclaimed our mission above all is dependent on jesus pray as though everything depends on god but work as though everything depends on you secondly our mission will be deeply divisive we see that in verse 3. Go, Jesus says, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. We're not to, 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 to see this mission, this work uh, with rose-tinted glasses. 
It will be hard. It will be difficult. It will be divisive. And we might wonder, if Jesus said, could he have picked a more stark contrast? Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Jesus says we will face opposition as we share the gospel. Because, why? Because it will sing in the souls of some, you could say, and yet stick in the throats of others. As some rejected Jesus, so they will reject his message now. It will be deeply divisive and there will be two reactions as we proclaim the gospel. There will be acceptance which will come with, with unimaginable liberation. As the 72 entered people's homes, as they proclaimed peace, some people received it with joy. As Jesus says, stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, sharing their celebration, their liberation. Heal those who are ill and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. Here is, if you like, is a picture of what God's kingdom will be like in eternity. A, a picture of gospel liberation. So there will be acceptance, but sometimes there will also be opposition. There will be rejection as lambs among wolves. And people will reject the gospel. Verse 10. When you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this. The kingdom of God has come near. So right at the end there of verse 11, Jesus says, God's kingdom has come near and will one day envelop the world. Opposition or no opposition. Mission will always be divisive, but it will never be futile. So our mission is dependent on Jesus. Our mission will be deeply divisive. And thirdly, our mission is really urgent. As we read in verse 4, Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. Here, as throughout our passage, there is a real sense of urgency. The, the idea of greeting no one on the road conveys that sense, doesn't it? That sense of urgency. Jesus is saying, quite simply, don't waste time on irrelevant things, but get on, get on with the main task of sharing the kingdom. Do not move around, he says in verse 7, from house to house. Even though the Middle East custom was to stay and socialise for hours and end, Jesus says, don't waste time socialising, get on, share the, and preach the gospel, share the good news to everyone you meet, so that as many may hear it as possible. Mission work is urgent. Why is it urgent? Above all, because of judgment. As Jesus says, yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. And then he goes on in verse 12 to give this warning. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Jesus is saying it will be worse for someone who rejects Jesus on the day of judgment than it was for Sodom. And what happened to Sodom? God rained down fire and destroyed that city. Our mission, proclaiming Jesus, is deeply urgent. There is quite simply only one way to be saved, and that's through repentance of faith and putting our faith and trust in Jesus. Rejection of Jesus, rejecting Jesus never leads to life. It's a one-way ticket to hell if you like. It's why, above all, our message is so very, very urgent. We need to share it and get on doing it. Do we make mission our priority? Our mission is dependent on Jesus. Our mission is deeply divisive. Our mission is really urgent. And then thirdly, and fourth, uh, then fourthly, um, our mission is verbal. And I'm looking at verse five here. As we speak the good news of Jesus, that is what is at the heart of Christian mission. Speaking, telling others verbally, if you can have that, um, speaking and telling and, and uh, verbal are all the same thing, of course. Um, the first International Congress on World Evangelization was held in Lausanne in Switzerland in 1974. Hosted by Billy Graham, he said this. 
we have one task to proclaim the message of salvation in Jesus we have one task to proclaim the message of Jesus this is a congress of world evangelization we are enthusiastic about all the many things which churches properly do but our calling is to evangelism from the time of the early apostles evangelism has been the lifeblood of the church he said this congress is convened to re-emphasize those biblical concepts which are crucial to evangelism and here's the crunch of what he said evangelism can mean nothing else than proclaiming jesus to persuade men and women to become his disciples and responsible members of his church what a brilliant uh, statement what a brilliant emphasis that our priority is jesus and as we put our faith and trust in jesus our priority has to be mission has to be proclaiming the good news of jesus willie philip who is the pastor of glasgow's tron church said this at the third congress of world evangelization which was held in cape town south africa in 2010 that was 38 six years after that first one where billy graham spoke and he says it seemed to me that at the third congress enthusiasm for many other things was so much in evidence such as, such as the church's response to poverty to aids to social justice social justice to child exploitation to global warmings and so on that they tended to dominate the program to the quiet subordination of billy graham's absolute priority for disciple making evangelism all these other really important things drown out the absolute priority of gospel proclamation so what is the mission of the church verse 5 says this when you enter a house first say absolute priority peace to this house that phrase peace to this house speaks of a restored relationship with god jesus says to the 72 forgiveness of sins is here the messiah has come reconciliation that restored relationship with god is possible why because jesus pays the price for our sins on the cross the heart of christian mission is verbally proclaiming the good news of what jesus has done it doesn't mean that as we go about our work our life sharing the good news of jesus we should ignore the the needs of the poor the socially outcast etc gospel proclamation will produce godly christians with a godly concern for our fellow human beings but the mission of every christian is first and foremost to make known verbally the glorious good news of the gospel we see this as we read verses 8 to 11 of our passage once a person responds to jesus they receive forgiveness receive the forgiveness that jesus alone can bring and then that person starts to receive the blessings and the benefits of belonging to god's people and the joy that that brings but those who reject and offer the blessings of the kingdom the challenge to us this morning today are you as passionate about as mission about mission about proclaiming the gospel as you were two or five or ten or twenty or thirty or fifty years ago are you as passionate about mission as a as the generation before you were particularly if you're from a christian heritage your parents your grandparents are you as passionate about jesus about mission as you are as your children are as jesus set his face towards jerusalem so we must set our lives to be on mission for him to be proclaimers of the good news of jesus and to speak of it verbally but we will need to expect it to be deeply divisive as we press on because we know it's really urgent as we do the work though we know that above all we need to be depending upon god upon jesus so i want to leave you with two thoughts two two practical applications this morning first of all we need to 
we need to recognise what Jesus is doing in our world. Jesus sets his face towards Jerusalem because his life was about rescue. C.S. Lewis puts it well. God made man for no other purpose than to draw people to himself, to draw people back into relationship with him. Right now, there is a harvest of souls to be reaped. Don't let the day-to-day -day things of life distract us. Jesus is powerfully at work as the Lord of the harvest to save sinners. So recognise what Jesus is doing in our world. And secondly, set your life to be on mission for Jesus. Pray for the harvest, for the harvest of the soul. Pray for more workers. And then labour yourself to reap that harvest and do it knowing that for the people we speak to it will be a message of salvation if they accept it but of judgment if they reject most of us work go to school see our families what will you have to show for your life's work a long service award or souls reaped for the kingdom. How many colleagues, how many friends have you shared the gospel with? Or parents, what are, your, what are your goals for you and your children? Wouldn't it be great at the last day not to look back and just think of family holidays and great memories and photos, but to glory in the fact that we have discipled our children well in Jesus. Let us then proclaim the gospel, always living our lives, always being on mission for Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the joy of being uh, people who are in restored relationship with our Heavenly Father. Help us, Lord, to make a priority sharing that good news that we heard with others as we go about our lives with our work colleagues with people we meet with our friends with our family let us proclaim the gospel and live as though we're living on mission for jesus every day of our lives in your name we pray